Right, so firstly, I'd like to thank uh, the AstraZeneca guys for very thoughtfully leaving a little bit early and giving me this lovely last, last session. Um, but I'm Irina Puzrukova, and today I'll be talking to you about a resource that I work on at Genomics England called Panelab. So Panelab is a publicly available knowledge base used for the creation and maintenance of gene panels that are associated with um, human conditions such as rare diseases and cancer. So historically, there was a lack of national standards being adopted by labs that were um, analyzing next generation sequencing data. And in order to address this, um, Panelab was created with the aim of gaining a consensus as to which uh, genes should be tested for specific uh, conditions. And this kind of would enable um, equity of care for patients. Um, because the resource is version controlled and uses standardized fields and terminology, there is an ability to integrate it into a genomic analysis pipeline. And for this reason, it's really become a integral part of the NHS Genomic Medicine Service in England. And this is really the first national healthcare system to offer whole genome sequencing as part of routine care. Um, so currently we have 191 uh, gene panels relating to various um, clinical indications in 17 different disease specialties. Um, the way that this works, so when a patient undergoes whole genome sequencing, uh, millions of variants are produced, majority of which will have nothing to do with uh, their condition. So we want to filter out for variants that are highly unlikely to be causing their condition. So we will filter out variants that are common in the general population, uh, synonymous variants, and, and also variants that don't follow the expected mode of inheritance or segregation pattern. But even after filtering for all these things, it leaves us with too many variants for a clinical scientist to, to go through. And this is kind of where Panelap comes in. So Panelap provides a list of genes, or in other words, panels, um, that are uh, relate to phenotypes that are similar to that of um, the patient's condition. And this kind of increases our chances of finding the true causal variant in each case. So each gene disease association will have a varying uh, strength of evidence, and it's kind of the job of the curators to go through this evidence. And to make our assessments, we'll take into account a number of factors, such as the number of cases that have previously been found um, with, with variants in those genes, uh, what the phenotype of those cases are, other things like functional studies and things. And we rate the strength of the evidence based on a traffic light system. So this is where red and amber genes have some level of evidence, but not quite strong enough to justify testing in a clinical setting. And a green rating is assigned to those genes with the highest strength of evidence, indicating that they are, variants in those genes are diagnostically reportable and should be used in a genome interpretation pipeline. Um, so this is a dynamic process. As new, new evidence emerges, the ratings of a gene might change, and everything is automatically versioned, um, meaning that this kind of allows transparency um, in decision-making and changes, and allows the content of a panel uh, to be retrieved um, that was used at the time of patient analysis at any point in the future. Um, so we do use a number of different sources to inform our assessments. Uh, we do use uh, data in published resources, such as other resources like OMIM and uh, Gene to Phenotype, and also information in published literature. But at Panelab, we also have access to unpublished genetic data. So we have a mechanism of um, having NHS clinicians feed back to us on cases that they might see in clinic. Um, and we also have this internal feedback loop, loop through the Diagnostic Discovery Initiative, uh, where any cases that have been diagnosed within the Genomics England pipeline can then get fed back to us and inform future analysis. Um, a feature of PanLab that I kind of want to highlight and is an incredibly valuable source of, source of information for us 
is crowdsource panel app reviews, which kind of allow us to capture input from the scientific and clinical community, um, and kind of really allows us to update panels based on expert knowledge and guidelines. So the way that this would work, uh, say a clinician finds um, a patient uh, with a newly discovered rare condition that isn't routinely tested, they can register to be a panel app reviewer, um, at which point they'll be able to add their gene to their most appropriate panel. Um, today, we've had 332 experts submit reviews to at least one panel, and many of them re uh, submit multiple reviews over the years. And even though the NHS make up a um, majority of our users, um, we have users from over 100 countries on a monthly basis. And this does kind of translate also to our reviewer community, who not only come from the NHS, but also other healthcare systems. Uh, we also have reviewers from academia and commercial companies. Um, so when a reviewer adds a gene to a gene panel, it automatically goes into this unclassified gray category. And then following the curation process and NHS approval process, um, because any changes that we curators would like to make to the GMS panels need to undergo a approval process by the NHS. Um, so this particular gene, for example, we were able to add it to three um, NHS GMS panels, um, meaning any patients going through the pipeline with variants in this gene would then be prioritized, uh, given that they pass the other, other criteria, filtering criteria. So over the year, the number of reviews that we do get does, does vary. For example, in January of 2022, we, we had an influx of um, reviews submitted by NHS colleagues due to an upcoming deadline. Uh, but overall, in 2022, we had about 400 reviews being submitted to, to PanelApp. And while this may not seem like an enormous number, every single review has to be carefully curated because the, our curations affect the way that patients will be analysed. Uh, we're not a very large team, and one review and one panel may need to be extended to other panels. Um, we also get quite a few gene lists being sent to us directly, as it might be difficult for, for reviewers to add one gene at a time. Um, so it's not truly representative of all of our work that we have. Um, so it's really important for us to be able to prioritise our work in an effective way. Um, and the way that we do this, so on a weekly basis, we extract all external activity using an API script, and every review is categorized in um, the level of priority. So those reviews that might lead to a change in a diagnostic green gene will be prioritized over others. Um, each review is tracked in the form of a tracking ticket and tickets are assigned to curators based on a designated disease specialty. So each curator can really become familiar with a set of panels and this kind of really helps us to increase our productivity. Um, so to give you an idea of how, how many uh, changes that we've been able to make so far, so when the panels were first signed off at the start of 2020, we started with about 11,000 green genes across all of our GMS panels. And in the space of two big releases, which happened quite recently in, the end, in November 2022 and March 2023, uh, we were able to add about an extra 2,000 green genes. Um, we also, um, and, and this kind of was new, new green genes and also phenotype expansions of, of existing, existing green genes. Um, we also cleaned up our data, so we demoted about 200 uh, green genes that upon reassessment, upon reassessment did not actually have enough evidence to meet the criteria. And we also changed the mode of inheritances of over two, 200 genes, improving the accuracy of downstream analysis. And kind of why is this important? So the more comprehensive our panels are and the better the quality of the data being, being presented kind of means that more clinically relevant variants can be detected in a higher number of patients. And PanelApp being a public resource um, kind of enables the data to be used um, for future research and development. 
So the continuous creation of gene panels has, has been proven to increase diagnostic yield in patients. And um, if you want to know more about this, my colleague, uh, Kevin Savage, kind of explains this in a really great way in his blog that's on the Genomics England website, and I've included a link there. Um, and we are looking for ways that we can kind of improve, improve our data and ways that we are doing this. Um, so we're starting to explore machine learning. But I want to emphasize, especially to this group, we are still very, very new in, in this, in this um, exploration. Um, but it, uh, we do kind of recognize the value of, of machine learning and how this can help us with, with our curation. And as, as we all know, data sharing is incredibly valuable in this field. So we are working closely with other resources, such as PanLab Australia, and other gene curation efforts uh, via the GenCC to kind of harmonize uh, gene disease assessments across these different gene curation efforts. Um, and with that, if anyone feels inspired by anything that I have said today, please, I do encourage you to have a look at PanLab and register to be a reviewer if you do have anything to contribute, because this, the data that we have really does help real patients, um, the, the real patients. <laughs> Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge um, all the participants of the 100,000 Genomes Project and the GMS, um, as well as our partners within the NHS that really have helped this update process um, happen. Um, also, our reviewers and our Genomics England family who, who have made PanLab what it is today. And with that, thank you very much for listening. I'd just like to take any questions. Thank Wonderful you. talk. Um, my question is, how do you recruit the reviewers, the people who contribute to this, and how you keep them? So, the, um, so we do um, have our very loyal NHS members that I think see the value in PanelApp, and they know that these are the panels that are being used for their patients. So. Uh, they, we do have recurring people coming back to us that want to want to contribute their knowledge. Um, and I guess coming to things like this, kind of publicizing panel app, staying engaged with um, scientists through Twitter and, and other things like that. Um, and I think things like Apicurum, for example, will kind of encourage more people to use it because we've definitely had... Uh, people ask us, you know, what, what is the benefit to me to coming and curating something like this apart beyond what is being analyzed for patients? So I think it's something like Apicurin where people can, can see that they're achieving something through uh, curating panel lab will also help. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, very nice talk. But as we all know, uh, the majority of results from from, from from, from GWAS are not directly associatable with a gene, especially proteins. So how does that affect, uh, are you going to go outside gene? Well, outside? in um, the scope of Paralap, it's just monogenic disorders. So we don't include kind of common common diseases like that. So GWAS is not something that, that we would really consider. So. How visible is the entire system? How do you decide on who can see it? And especially, you probably want to have wide visibility to get input. On the other hand, you probably don't want that somebody said, I sent my, uh, my saliva to sequence me, and then I used your panels, and now I have diagnosed myself. Yeah. So how do you make these decisions? Um, so panel app itself is is open for anyone to view so anyone can go and and, and see the data but we don't use any uh, patient identifying information so we if we use any published information we will always reference that anything coming internally that might not already be published we do really try and take care to not include anything that would lead back to that patient whether that means sometimes missing out the specific variant that was found in that individual and just saying there was a variant that was identified. Um, but it just serves as a repository of, of genes that have previously been associated with disease. Okay. Um, 
Thanks. Uh, can you s just talk a little bit more about the coordination with GenCC? Is it the case that if I download the GenCC list, I get everything that's in Panel App, or do you only expose a subset to GenCC? Um, at the moment, we've only submitted a subset. So we submitted um, all of our green genes and a subset of our amber genes. Um, and we're currently working with the GenCC in kind of resolving any discrepancy resolution. Um, but we do plan on kind of expanding, expanding that. But from what I know, we just submitted a subset to form their pilot. And in the future, we'll plan to submit more of our data. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very Thank much. You.